Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How is everyone doing? This morning, we're going to read out of Psalm 33, 13. The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. Before we kick this off, I shared this on the community post uh, yesterday because uh, YB had uh, posted this and I had all but forgotten about this verse. And it's great encouragement for what we're watching for. So if you'll indulge me for a minute, let's run over there. It's 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus will keep us from the tribulation. Not through it, not through part of it, from it out of. Uh, I'm not sure if the word used here, there's a Greek word of uh, ektoreto, which means kept out of. This and Hebrews 9.28 encourage me greatly. When they talk all this talk and have all these arguments and all these debates and they all they want to do is sit down and talk about how wrong we are and how right they are and how we're going to fail because we have faith and we believe and we're holding on to and trusting in, not realizing that those very words that they say condemn them because this is what the Lord told us to do and they're not doing that. If you don't know what Hebrews, I'm talking about in Hebrews 9.28, these are ones to write down. Hebrews 9.28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. There's a lot in this verse. I know there's a lot of new subscribers and they maybe not have not heard me talk about this verse. Let me give you a brief uh, run through. Jesus came the first time for sin. This says he will come a second time apart from sin. People might say, well, that's the judgment. No, the last time he comes is for judgment. This he's going to come for salvation. This is a third return. And they always argue, well, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says he'll, he's going to come a third time. Here you go. First, he came for sin. Next, he's coming for the church. And then last, he's coming for judgment. So Hebrews 9.28 and 1 Thessalonians 1.10 offer great encouragement to the believer in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Because it proves that our Lord is coming for us. To those eagerly waiting for him. Who's eagerly waiting for him? He gives ownership as to who he's coming for specifically. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. Notice he doesn't say to those who eagerly wait for him and everyone else. He's giving ownership of who he's coming for. A specific group of people. I find that very interesting. To those who eagerly wait for him. Our Lord is returning. That's you and me, because on this channel, we believe in a pre-tribulation deliverance of the church. A pre-tribulation harpazo. I've covered it in depth in previous videos. There's a lot in the Bible about it. So for all of you who are tired, who are discouraged, who are waiting, keep waiting. Keep waiting eagerly for him, because he's coming for us that eagerly wait for him. He's giving very specific ownership on this. There's a lot of people out there that are under very false assumptions concerning this very same thing. We are the ones watching for him. We are the ones that believe and, true and trust <coughs> his word and what it says. Now let's get to our target verse today, which is Psalm 3313. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. Let's read this in context. Starting in verse 8, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Amen. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. 
The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons from men, sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. This is an interesting verse. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for our Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. Powerful Psalm. Perhaps no figure of speech represents God in a more gracious light than when he is spoken of as stooping from his throne to come down from heaven to attend to the wants and to behold the woes of mankind. What an honor and a privilege it is that God would consider us and what we endure here. He has shown great mercy to us and great compassion to us concerning this life here. We love him who, when Sodom and Gomorrah were full of iniquity, would not destroy those cities until he had made a personal visitation of them. We cannot help pouring out our heart in affection for our Lord who inclines his ear from the highest glory and puts it to the lip of the dying sinner whose failing heart longs after reconciliation. How can we but love him when we know that he numbers the very hairs of our heads, marks our path, and orders our ways. He knows everything you are ever going to do in your life, and he knew it thousands, millennia ago. Thousands upon thousands of years ago, before we were ever born. Especially is this great truth brought near to our heart when we recollect how attentive he is, not merely to the temporal interest of his creatures, but to their spiritual concerns. Though leagues of distance lie between the finite creature and the infinite creator, yet there are links uniting both. When a tear is wept by thee, think not that God doth not behold. For like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. In, in, in another psalm, Jesus catches those tears and puts them in his little bottle in his book. Thy sigh is able to move the heart of Jehovah. Thy whisper can incline his ear unto thee. Thy prayer can stay his hand. Thy faith can move his arm. Back when my son was very, very little, he had issues with his ears and he had to have little tubes in his ears. And uh, we were having so many problems. Uh, we were struggling with his, his learning issues. He was, being, he was being held back by stuff. Just, it was nonstop, and it just, it finally got to me. I was working so much overtime trying to be able to pay for all this and to keep up with everything. And at that time, I was working with the company. It, it, and then it was called Motorola. They've sold it since then. Um, and I was just killing myself. I was just working as much as I possibly could. And uh, it finally got to me, and I broke down. And I got down, there was this machine I was working on, a coating machine, and it used a siliconized uh, coating material that would protect circuitry on hard circuit boards that were through-hole placement. And so some of you might not understand what that means. I had to, there were some of the boards that had to have sp specific uh, coating put on specific areas. It was key areas uh, because of the type of, of uh, components that were placed there. So we would have to add extra in those places and then send it through the machine. So I had we had this little valve that was down in the middle of the machine, down underneath near the floor, and we could open it and had a vat in there, a storage vat, and we could fill up these our little squirt bottles. It was little ketchup and mustard bottles, basically you see in the restaurants, the old school ones. And we'd fill those up. And so I was filling it up because we were getting ready to do a whole series of these boards. Well, where I was kneeling, nobody could get to me unless they came at me from the front or the back. Nobody was at the machine at that time. I was running it by myself. 
Nobody could get to me from the side because there was a conveyor belt along there. And I started to cry. I couldn't help it. I was overwhelmed because I was so tired, so frustrated. It was like I was beating my head against the wall because I wasn't able to make any headway in anything. Hard as I tried, couldn't get, couldn't move forward. And a hand rested on my shoulder. It was a left hand. I could tell because the thumb was behind my shoulder and the fingers were over, over the front of my shoulder. And it was warm. And I reached my hand up and there was no hand there. I tell you, as I'm sitting here filming this video, it was a hand. Somebody put their hand on my shoulder to reassure me and let me know everything was going to be okay. I realized at that moment when I had touched my shoulder and there was no hand there, that it was Jesus. Because he knew what was going on. He knew what I was enduring. And he knew, what, he knew, I didn't know what I was going to endure in the following years. So he was strengthening me and encouraging me. So when you're going through issues like this and what we just read, thy whisper can incline his ear into thee. Thy prayer can stay his hand. Thy faith can move his arm. Your sigh is able to move the heart of Jehovah. I, I know that's true because it happened to me. It's a powerful thing when the Lord touches you, actually puts his hand on your shoulder. It's an amazing thing. And I don't know of many accounts of, of that happening to people. It wasn't some kind of ethereal thing. It was a moment, a moment that he gave me. I felt each individual finger. cares for us in ways you can't possibly realize until you experience them. And then you start to see and realize the real glory of the Lord in that he shows us such great mercy. And, and once you're moved by that, once something like that happens, it changes how you think and how you respond. Think not that God sits on high taking no account of thee. He numbers the hairs of our head like it said. The Bible is very clear how, how every single intimate detail about us is recorded. Think not that God sits on high taking no account of thee. Remember that however poor and needy thou art, yet the Lord thinketh upon thee. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. And he does that. Look at what's happening today. Did you ever think you would see people in, up in high office in, in America actually start to get held accountable? And this has been my cry. Lord, hold these people accountable for what they're doing. They're doing evil. And look what's happening. The Lord is holding them accountable. Never thought we'd see the day, and yet here it comes. And it's about to get very weird. <laughs> We're about to see things happen in this country that's never happened before. <laughs> Just wait. Oh, then repeat the truth that never tires. No God is like the God my soul desires. He at whose voice heaven trembles, even he, great as he is, knows how to stoop to me. Remember that we didn't go to Jesus for salvation. He came to us. God born in the flesh. He came down from his heavenly dwelling to dwell among us as one of us. He felt these pains. He felt these fears. He felt these emotions. He endured these trials and tribulations of normal life for us. Something he didn't know, even though he created us. He dwelt among us and experienced these things. And he knows more, so much more intimately all of this than we do because not only did he relate to us as creator because nothing was created 
None, nothing that was created was created without the hand of Christ. He created us. He knows us in that way. He also knows us because he lived as one of us. He came down from heaven for us. We didn't go to him. Nobody asked him. He came down. He came down here to die for us. To live as one of us and to die for us. So, you know, when they have that, that stupid song they come out, what if God was one of us? Well, the thing is, he was. And now he's waiting in heaven for us. Now he's opened the doors wide to allow anyone to be saved with this free gift offered to everyone. No strings attached, no requirements, no nothing. And the Lord has done everything, literally everything. This is why he's been quiet for 2000 years. He's done everything. There was nothing more that he needs to do there's nothing more. I mean, I say there's nothing more he can do. There is more he can do, but it, concerning giving free will, there's nothing more he can do. It, it stopped right here. There's nothing more that he needs to do. He's done it all. And look at how the world responds. We should realize, because we're believers, that it is a great privilege and a great honor and a great gift that he gave us the ability to believe. He gave us the faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 doesn't say, by grace you have been saved through faith. By your grace you have been saved through your faith. It says, by grace you have been saved through faith. And the following verse is key. This is not of yourselves. It's not your faith. It's not your grace. It is a gift of God. He gave us these things. He gave us the grace to be able to be saved. He gave us the faith to be able to believe. He gave us those things. What a gift. What a wonderful, perfect gift. That he would look at us. And who are we? We're nothing compared to him. We're nothing compared to anything in creation. And yet he looks at us. He regards us. That is an amazing thing. That our Father in Heaven, our God who exists outside of this reality, you can't you can't create a reality from within it. You create it from outside of it. He exists outside of this. We don't know where he comes from. We don't know what or who he actually is. We just know what the Bible tells us. That he is our father. What a beautiful thing to have a God who created us regard us, look at us, consider us. And then do everything else he's been doing for us. Protect us, watch over us, provide for us. Direct our paths. And so much more. What a gracious God have we. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. <clears throat> to lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Holy Father, thank you for this holy word and thank you for this devotion. I thank you, Father, that you have shown us such grace and mercy and compassion. That you have taking the time to consider us, to look at us, to see us. And consider the ways that we go. Mark out a path for us to walk. Give us the things that we need to be able to believe, to be able to look to you and to understand and to know and to see and to wonder and to believe. To give, giving us this word to believe. People don't realize how much of a gift it is that you gave us this complete word and have preserved it all this time. How is it possible that a piece of the book of Exodus, Exodus 12, has survived for over 4,500 years and yet they found it last year? Or what, the year before, one of them. How is it that they found it? 
And it's a perfect mesh to what we have now. Proof. You preserved that. That's papyrus. That's plant material. That should have been gone. That should have been gone thousands of years ago. And yet it survived in a trash dump. It was dug up by somebody. And it's a perfect match to what we have today. You kept your promise. You keep all your promises. You kept your promise at preserving your word for all time. And we have physical proof that shows that. You have kept your promise about salvation. You've kept your promise about deliverance. You keep your promises about everything. And so we can bank on you keeping your promise about removing us before the real wrath comes. Removing us before the tribulation. We can take you at your word and, and hold you to your promises of everything you've said. Because to date... Your word has been 100% accurate and you have kept every single promise. And so there's no reason to think otherwise. You will keep every promise. <laughs> Father, who are we that you would regard us? Who are we that you would consider us? YB gave a testimony about their garden that they started late. They're in Canada. They have a very, very small uh, season for gardening. Very short growing season. They started late. Prayed over their garden, and you have provided enough for them there and all their neighbors. You fed everybody. 800 pounds of potatoes? Good night. That's a lot of potatoes. That's a truckload of potatoes. What an amazing, amazing thing. For you to answer our prayer, for you to keep our request, for you to hold us accountable, and then keep your word concerning anything you hold us to. Just, we can keep going. We can keep going on and on. Lord, you are the most gracious God. You are the most merciful God. And your grace and mercy endure forever. What a wonderful gift to have you as our Father. What a wonderful gift to know you consider us. And you direct our paths. And you know us on a level so intimate we can't even begin to understand. Because not only did you create us. And you know us in that sense, but you came and lived as one of us and know us in that sense too. You know what it's like to live here. You know what it's like to be a human. You know what it's like to live this life. What a what an amazing thing. What an amazing thing. What an amazing God that we have that knows us better than we know us. So Father, I, my gratitude knows no limit. I thank you for all that you have done, all that you will continue to do, all that you plan to do. And I am in awe of your greatness, in awe of your incredible compassion and love for us. I thank you, Father, that you have chosen us to be saved and then gave us what we needed to believe, to trust, to know who you are, to know what your word is saying and to live according to that. And I pray that you continue to do that for your glory, that we, we may be able to glorify you. We believe, help our unbelief, that we may glorify you more in this life and in the next one. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray, amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for morning devotion. It's a powerful thing to come to the realization to know that the infinite God takes the time to consider finite me. The infinite God who's been alive forever, both directions, he has no beginning, he has no end, as the Bible says. He just was. And it's always been that way. So we, we think linear. It's much different outside of this creation. That you can't even count his age in eons. And he comes down and he looks at us who are wisps of smoke in our lifespan. 80 years. If by strength. 
of his boast as laboring sorrows. And he considers us. If there was dust in heaven, we wouldn't even be on a level of consideration of, of dust on the floor of heaven. And yet he considers us and holds us in much higher regard. How amazing. How amazing that our God does that for us. It, it should humble every one of us. That he would look at us that way. That he would consider us that way. That he would do so much and move so much for us. I and mean, he moves the earth for us. He moves the world for us. He moves the environment for us. It's amazing. Amazing, incredible. What a great God we have. What a what a friend we have in Jesus. To love us and care for us so much. We should love him a fraction of that much. What a blessing we have. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.